Fab. So I'm so excited about this book. I cannot tell you. I'm so excited. When I offered to, to look at this book with Melanie, I, I had no idea what was going to break onto the news in the weeks before this. So it's just so amazing. So you need to hold on to your hats because it's such a good ride. Okay, so the Book of Esther or Book of Hadassah, her Jewish, uh, he, her Hebrew name. But why are we looking at a book full of rape, objectification of women, sexual manipulation, fear, court intrigue and plans for ethnic cleansing and it doesn't mention god's name anywhere and it's got dark humor and it's got some very questionable outcomes well i chose it i chose it actually for my spirit but i did choose it for some very straightforward reasons really so if you open any newspaper you can tick off that list pretty much on page one okay relevance completely it's also a ripping read it's a great story it's very skillfully written and it's it builds tension on these eight feasts which go round and round and it's a common literary device at the time called mirroring so it's that beautiful read a bit like ruth the book of ruth it's beautifully put together and then it's an account of three individual rebellions of one how timely is that as we look to may the first i mean how timely so we've got vashti esther and mordecai we are going to focus on them in a, in a few minutes um, because I want to sustain us on this journey of civil disobedience. There's no good doing if we do not have a sense of why we do what we do. And we must be able to give clear uh, another spiritual mandate. We've got some, some books under our belt, but we must get this under our belt as we talk to, to courts, as we talk to churches, as we talk to clerics. So I want to view the book as a river, all right? All I can do in these 20 minutes, 25 minutes, is to grab a few stones from the riverbed and roll them around with you. You guys need to get in the river yourself after. Please get in the river and swim in it. It's the most brilliant, brilliant book. So as we go, I want us to self-reflect on Esther's complex courage. It's complex. Mordecai's understanding of godly government. Haman's self-preservation. And King Xerxes, I'm going to call him King Xerxes because his other name is much more complicated to say. So I'm going to call him that. And King Xerxes' detached ignorance. OK, and it's a quick health warning. I really wanted to see myself in Esther and Mordecai, but actually I saw a lot, an awful lot of Xerxes' ignorance and Haman's power grabbing in myself. So that's just a health warning as we go through. So we're now going to do a two minute. I've, I've shoved the, the summary into two minutes. I've written it for us. So don't worry if you haven't read it. Just listen to me read it through. It only takes two minutes. The action is 500 years before Jesus. In Susa, the capital of Persia, modern day Iran, if you're interested, Queen Vashti snubs King Xerxes' request to show her off. So he fires slash divorces her and orders all the men everywhere to keep their women in line. He needs a new queen through dubious means suggested by his advisors. He eventually sex selects Esther. Why not? Beautiful, young, virgin, secretly Jewish, who's part of his harem. Up to this point, Esther, an orphan, was living uh, with her cousin uh, Mordecai, and they were both happily settled in Persia. They hadn't gone back with the rest. So anyway, everyone likes Esther, and eventually Xerxes chooses her. Of course he does. And Mordecai, who by now conveniently is working in admin at the palace, he uncovers a plot to kill the king. And he tells Esther, who warns Xerxes just in time. And this earns Mordecai some very big brownie points. But treachery is afoot. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman, who has been promoted to prime minister. Snubbed. Haman finds out that Mordecai is <gasps> Jewish. And so he plots to kill <gasps> all the Jews in Persia. Xerxes agrees, especially when he's offered enormous amounts of money. However, Xerxes doesn't know that Esther is Jewish because she's kept a secret as Mordecai has told her to. The plot to kill the Jews kickstarts the action. Mordecai wails in sackcloth outside the palace gates and Esther fasts for three days before visiting the king. Now Xerxes kill her for visiting him unannounced, but he's pleased to see her and he offers whatever she wants. She asks for a banquet for her and Haman the next day and the day after that too. Meanwhile, Haman is rubbing his hands in glee at the Jewish massacre that's about to happen and he builds these huge gallows to hang Mordecai. But his hopes are dashed the following morning when the king has a light bulb moment and remembers how Mordecai had saved his life. He orders Haman to honor Mordecai, parade him through the town. Haman reluctantly does this. At the second banquet, Esther asks Xerxes to punish Haman for plotting to kill her and her people, and the king hands Haman on the gallows that had been built for Mordecai. 
The Jews of Persia kill Haman's thousands of supporters, Mordecai is promoted, and Purim becomes an official Jewish holiday. Wow. Before we look at the three rebellions of one, there are three really relevant themes for our time. Just listen to these. One, it's a critique of the monarchy. Need we say more? I think I might send a copy to Meghan, Harry and Piers. Two, it's a feminist manifesto. And don't we need more power, equity and freedom for women in our days? Ask Sarah Everard's nearest and dearest. It is worth noting that when Queen Vashti refused to be paraded as the trophy, the king's advisors clamped down on all women everywhere. The bruised male pride caused an even harder, more aggressive reaction. The advisors could have said this to him, look, go and ask Vashti how you could change, what you would be like to live with, what you can do better, why she said no. But instead they react, they shut down, and then they blame. And on March the 10th this year, 97% of women said they had experienced sexual harassment. And tragically, when many have said no to sexual harassment, when they have stood up, and the snub has created an even harder crushing reaction. This book is so in the moment. And the third thing the theme is, it's a political critique. So the characters are, are painted in broad brush strokes, but there are underlying themes and here they are and they are far from trivial. They raise these questions. At what point does a ruler become unfit to rule? So we see Xerxes in the pocket of his advisors until he ends up in the sole grasp of the one he has appointed above everybody else, the power grabbing Haman. And leaders in our day seem to be fit to rule if they have a pulse. OK, that seems to be the kind of the benchmark. Money and power prop up leaders. Fear and fake news pop up leaders. But so does poor memory of failure keep them in power. Just check out the U-turn in government and popularity since the vaccine rollout it's in front of our face so i ask again at what point does a ruler become unfit for rule and then the second question it raises and if they're deemed unfit then what is our responsibilities so when is civil de disobedience not only allowed but it's imperative the book sucks us into this ethnic cleansing plot when is enough enough when is imperative citizens speaking up shouting out lying down in inconvenient places raising the alarm of government failure. When is that imperative? And again, this is so on trend, the police powers growing in the US, the UK seeming to morph the ones in the USA, and the police crime sentencing courts bill having that first hurdle in the, on the 16th of March. You know, MP Clive Efford, call, Efford called the bill a Tory-led coup without guns. And MP Gavin Robinson said the right to protest should be protected. So the bill that will reduce our ability to raise relevant and urgent protest against failing governments. It's looking at that. And then the last theme it brings up is why continue to believe in social justice in a seemingly unjust world? Because the systems are set up to serve the strong and silence the weak. So the themes are there and those themes, my friends, are pulsing and raging today in March 2021. So now let's focus in on our three rebellions of one, but keep those themes in the background. The first rebel, rebel number one, is Queen Vashti. A few lines in, please don't underestimate her role. So Xerxes has ruled only for four years at this point when he faces the first challenge to his authority. And the challenge does not come from the people. It comes from within his own household. His queen refuses to show herself off to his court. Some Jewish writings say it was because he was asking her to be naked. No, no evidence for that, but it's just an interesting point. We don't know why she says no, but I think we can imagine her saying this. No, I'm not a thing. And I'm certainly not your thing. Perhaps her intimate familiarity with him had led her to feel long before the rest of the court that he was not worthy of respect. Oh, if Melania Trump had had this book to hand. And instead of Xerxes reflecting on his behavior, he does what is culturally expected in Persia at the time. He turns to his advisors. They, as I have already said, clamp down on all women in the land. This is never going to work. OK, you stamp it here, they pop up here. You stamp them there, they pop up. It's never going to work. So this overreaction and wrong focus loses him respect, which causes two of his security staff to plot to kill him. So squash a protest. What happens is you end up with another problem over here. So a quick first teaching point. Vashti said no. We've talked about this before when I've done other teachings. Saying no 
was all it took though for her to set the stage for Esther. She didn't know that was what she was doing, but her refusal here created a space here. Let's just remember that. No here creates a space here. And having hung out with her female friends for seven days, so were feasting and chatting, I think she found the courage deep in her heart to say, nah, 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 nah. So having hung out with our own kind, well, her own kind, she saw him in sharp contrast. contrast. Maybe it gave her the courage, we don't know. Either way, our first act of rebellion, as I've said so many times, is the word no, uttered first in our own hearts and then out loud. No. No, I will not do that. Put up with that. Carry on with that. Be part of that. Advocate for that. Be complicit in that. No, I will not bank there. Read that. Speak like that. Shop there. Hang out there. Join in with this, that or the other. You fill in the blanks. The word no is much easier to speak out when we have been surrounded by those who get us in our struggles, which is why XR and CCA and other NVDA groups need to build the internal voice of no. We have to build it. It's interesting, we don't know what happened to Vashti. She resigned from a top position in a company of poor ethics, sexism, gender inequality, and she demoted, so demoted herself from a toxic environment. She would rather go without than be part of the firm. And this, please let's not underestimate the deep courage it took to do that. This may mean for some of us, the actual work we do is the toxic place. We need to consider that deeply. For others, the church is that toxic place, okay? Vashti may have been killed, or at best she ended up in as a concubine, never leaving the palace, never having a chance to love again, a prisoner in her own home. But her actions made a space for her replacement, who managed to leave before greater change. This is another part of her rebellion, and I love this. It kind of came to me in the middle of the night last night. Passing the baton on is a good way to rebel. So we've explored in climate and color series, okay? Passing the baton from a man to a woman, good. From a white to a black, great from rich to poor, brilliant, from straight to queer, great, from the older to the younger, great, because those on the outside and the underside, their questions will never come into the middle if we do not hand that baton on. So Vashti handed the baton on, Esther's questions came to the middle. Okay, really interesting. She's got about one line in there. Rebel number two, Mordecai. As we know, Xerxes fired his entire cabinet because he was paranoid about a potential coup and he gave Haman all the power. Does that remind you of anybody in our kind of country who was given extraordinary power in the government? You can fill in the blanks, just got to be thinking. Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman in the street repeatedly. Now, what's going on here? Is this a religious act or is it an act of civil disobedience? Why does he refuse? So Mordecai refused to bow down, not because Haman was a mere man. That is not what this is about. But he refused to bow down because it was totally wrong to have power focused on and in one person. So no individual sees 100% truth. Decisions must be made in the round of government. Now this is, this is fascinating. By silencing the voices of dissent and disagreement in his cabinet, Xerxes had smashed his Persian traditional consensus-based decision-making process. Long sentence, traditional consensus-based decision-making process. He destroyed any chance of getting any decisions which truly benefited his people. Quote, big underline on your notes, dissent is necessary for good policy-making. So in the light of the bill this week, which will shut down dissenting voices, Mordecai, I do believe, would say, make a stand, protest. The minute Haman is elevated to the sole advisor, he's actually the prime minister, this is idolatry as far as Mordecai is concerned, because it's taking the place of the only one person who has 100% truth is God. This man does not. There are no checks, there are no balances, and there is no discourse because it's shut down. This is very, very dangerous. Does it sound familiar? Dictators. Army generals, I'm sure you can fill in the blanks of overly powerful leaders who have operated as an island of one. In his book, God and Politics in Esther, Yoram Hazoni shows the Jewish tradition is strongly against rulers acting against the greater good of their people because it's seen as going against the will of God. And it implies, applies particularly to moral leadership because moral leadership threatens the extinction of whole societies, in fact, the whole life on earth. 
we see it today, right? Policies made to line pockets of a few, short-sighted thinking, cronies loving cronies, the haves and the have-nots. I could go on. So it is this movement from a just government to a power-hungry idolatry that Mordecai is protesting, okay? From a just government to power-hungry idolatry. And Hasni again says this great quote, the state, never too highly regarded in the Bible, remains tolerable to the extent that it remains open to the competition of views as represented by the 18 advisors surrounding Xerxes at the start of the story. What brutalizes every state, every state is the inclination of the powerful to shut out competing voices that must be heard if one is to reach a judgment that is at all reasonable. Wow, powerful from a Jewish scholar. So in the face of injustice, civil disobedience, my friends, in CCA becomes a religious obligation, which is why we have Tim and Ben where they are. God takes offense at injustice, but unlike Xerxes, God works through channels of competing ideas. How brilliant is that? That so all of us are members of his inner cabinet. You, we use our voices, make our, our dissenting voices heard. It's vital for governments. In fact, it is a gift to government. It is a massive, massive wrapped up gift with a huge bow on top landed at number 10. Dissenting voices must be heard. Hence, citizen assembly idea is so on track. So then Mordecai actually rebels a second time. He's a bit of a legend. He puts on sackcloth and ashes and he wails and he makes a public noise. A creative act, a way of bringing faith and symbolism, a bit like our vigils, I think, into the, sacred, into the secular space. And others follow suit. He's a role model. There's no such thing as a secular space. And Mordecai shows it. So we need to keep our actions in CCA creative and appropriate for the coming doom. The Jewish people were about to get massacred. So his wails, my friends, were appropriate, right? Let's keep symbolic creative actions center stage. Creative acts that are disruptive, but deeply in tune with our faith traditions in truth telling use our bodies like he did to reflect the sorrow and anguish. Create outward signs of lament. Draw on the traditions of prophets and truth tellers in all cultures, indigenous peoples particularly. Creative acts, music, drama, dance, draw on deeper and release others to enter the rebellion through the creative act itself. Because other people followed him, he did something, they did it, and by following it, their hearts followed, I think. So sometimes it's the act that brings the heart. And then our third rebel, rebel number three, Esther. You're going to love this. When you punch in Esther's rebellion into Google, you get Extinction Rebellion. Now, I'm sorry, but isn't that amazing? I just, I really think that's amazing. That just made me, made me laugh out loud. People have criticized her for being passive and submissive because the language is, is in the passive voice. And it gives the impressions that characters are caught up in circumstances beyond control. But I want to say, I think that's the wrong focus. At once inside the palace, Ka Esther's character is tested, okay? And I'm drawn to a particular repetition in the text. Esther listened to Mordecai. She listened to Haggai. She listened to Mordecai again. She seeks counsel amidst the highly complex circumstances beyond her control. And God grows her into a woman of conviction. So she sought counsel. She listened in the highly complicated circumstances. So the challenge to us, do we apply ourselves to the complexities of this crisis or do we go for the bland, simplistic or bold solutions? Do we look for the nuance? Do we join the dots of racism, cli climate crisis, poverty, feminism, animal welfare, arms deals, capitalism, dot, dot, dot? We must pursue wise counsels. We are good at this, actually, from governments. Um, not from governments, sorry, from scientists, from philosophers, from theologians, from artists, from children, dot, dot, dot. Are we willing to lean into the din, the cacophony of noise that comes at every side and pick out the truth? And often it's a still small voice. So God uses the collaborative efforts of Esther and Mordecai to save the people. And we must pull together with other faiths. We're very good at this. We're very, very good at it. We must collaborate, keep networking, draw alongside those of any people with the same values. We are complementary, for example, to Operation Noah and Tear Fund, Arosha and Christian Aid. But we are unique in our calling to NVDA. 
Okay, so we need to remain unique whilst collaborating. The Bible narratives re revealed incredible blessing when we work together for human flourishing. Mordecai and Esther, okay? She's not submissive, she absolutely is listening. And so I think the book of Esther, her rebellion, isn't to show us how to behave in morally ambiguous situations. It kind of shows us how God works in spite of them. So the emphasis on what God is doing in spite of it. She didn't reveal her identity. She didn't reveal her origin or her faith. And she rebelled. This is an interesting one for me. I think this is really challenging. She re rebelled by remaining quiet until she could see the time was right. So rebellion can be silence. It can be waiting until it's relevant and timely. Now, this is the reason I say this is her silence meant Haman was revealed for what he was. OK, if she had shouted and gone this, this, this and the other, his motives would never have been exposed. So biding time can be useful because, as we said before, operation and uh, prep um, sorry, opportunity and preparation coming together are powerful. She remained silent until she had the ear of the king. OK. And it's our prayer, it's always been our prayer at CCA, that we need the ear of the, the, the top ear. We haven't got time to faff about. <laughs> so I think it's amazing. If she hadn't been silenced at that time, then Haman would not have been exposed. I think that's really interesting. So her, another challenge she poses us in her rebellion is, do we have the balls at times to say nothing? So do we have the balls to silently wait and watch? And I think we do. That's why we hold our silent earth vigils, right? We are doing that. We are holding that space. But where in your life and my life are we watching? Where are we waiting? Where we're serving? And we're waiting for that minute to go now. Where is it? And maybe the chance to rebel for you and me may actually come through our day job, our family and our church, where you're hanging out. It might not be on the street at all. Her rebellion for one was serious. She says this, if I die, I die. OK, her deep rebellion was internal, I believe, and she rebelled by letting her attachment to her very life go. And this is why she's such a deep, deep example. Anyone followed? I'm sure you have the wonderful Sister Anne Rose New Tong from Myanmar who knelt down. And this was her sentence. I have thought myself dead already since February the 28th. Ahead of time, the Myanmar nun had worked out what was required of her in here okay and in here and then that and that led her body to kneel down okay i think that for me has been so challenging in the study she gave up her life the, the nun so did esther in case she well before it would have been required of her now that is deeply challenging for me so let's make no bones about it ben and tim haven't just ended up in prison they made that decision to give up that 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 freedom that that um space they made that decision a long time ago or, or a while ago. So the point is, this internal thing is, has got to happen. So I think where I want to leave it before we go into breakout rooms is this. Rebellion and protesting is never an act or an arrest or a speech. It is a posture. It is a whole life posture. Our whole life posture here and here will then lead us to various far-reaching NVDA acts of protest. Okay, it's a posture. 